Hello everybody, James with Love My Pups. So Q&A session, um, let's go right in it. Okay, somebody says that they're asking about the offspring that's possible from two brindle and blue dogs. All right, so she says that she has a, uh, she's got a blue brindle male so that would be little d, little d, k, b, k, y, one copy of Brindle. And she says that, that it had a lilac daddy. So if it has a lilac daddy, it has to have one copy of chocolate because lilacs are little b, little b. It has to give it chocolate away every time. And it, by the way, it can't have two copies of chocolate because if it was, it'd be a lilac. We know it's not that. And Daddy's got 10 points. So we're going to assume that this dog also has one copy of 10 points and one copy of not. So that would be that. Okay, so that is the male. That's what we know about the male. Okay, then she has a blue brindle female. So this is the female. And she says this dog is a Brindle, so again, we're going to assume one copy of Brindle. Um, and she's made the statement that it has a chocolate and de tan parent. So if that's the case, this dog also has to have inherited a copy of chocolate. And since it also has a tan parent, it has to have a copy of tan points, the AT tan points, like over here. So the question is, what can we expect offspring-wise from those two dogs? So, everybody has to be blue because we have no other choices there. And everybody is either going to be, you've got some possibilities here. You could get some KBR, KB, KB dogs, totally brindle. You're going to get that a quarter of the time. And you could get some KY, KY dogs. They are not brindle, but you get that a quarter of the time. And the rest of the time, you get a copy of Brindle and a copy of not Brindle, half the time. So the answer is, is that you're going to get a quarter of the time no Brindle, and three quarters of the time, you're going to get Brindle. So you've got to contend with Brindle here, unfortunately. You're going to get some Brindle dogs. So I want a quarter of the time no Brindle. So that's where you are with the Brindle. So you are going to get a majority of Brindle dogs out of this pairing. No way around that. Okay, so now what happens here? Similar kind of situation here. What are your choices? Your choices are to get BB chocolate dogs. You'll get that one quarter of the time. Or you'll get B, big B, little B chocolate carriers. You'll get that half the time. Or you'll get no chocolate at all, one quarter of the time. So the answer is only one quarter of the dogs are going to be chocolate and those with a blue will be lilacs so you're going to get one quarter lilacs so here we go one quarter lilacs and then on the AYT gene same thing's going to happen again your possibilities are AT AT get that one quarter of the time AT AY get that half the time and AY AY get that a quarter of the time so you could absolutely get here some lilac dogs that are full tan points that don't carry brindle, but the chances are pretty darn slim for all of that to line up. In fact, to be exact about that, for that to happen, it would only happen one quarter of the time, and one quarter of the time with full time tan points, and one quarter of the time with no brindle. So you can see the chances of that happening are only at like one in 64. They are not very really likely. You multiply all this together. So a quarter and a quarter would be a sixteenth, and a sixteenth times four would be a one thirty-second. So only one thirty-second of the time would you expect to get what you really want, which would be a lilac dog with full ten points and no brindle. Are you going to get it now? Probably not, unless you have get really lucky with a big litter. So um, you know you can do all of these combinations to find out what you get, and to come up with all the possibilities you're going to get here is going to take a whole blackboard and like another thirty minutes worth of work to show you exactly what the variations, probabilities are. But basically, out of this breed, you'd expect to get blue dogs most of the time that carry chocolate and carry a copy of Brindle. That's what you expect to get most of the time. But you can get um, uh, lilac dogs that have tan points, do and don't have Brindle. 
um, and you could get um, blue dogs that don't carry any chocolate at all. So those are your combinations. All right, I think I've gone that way too long, but uh, that was uh, hopefully the other questions are going to come up a little quicker. Otherwise, you're going to be listening to me for three hours. <laughs> and I think I don't think anybody's going to anybody's going to do that. The only person who'd listen to me for three hours is myself. Nobody else in the world is going to possibly do that. All right. Okay. How do you get DNA results? Well, you can. Um, you can order cheek swabs, put them in their mouths, and you can send them off to UC Davis, VetGen, Animal Genetics. Those are the three that I know of that are good people. And specifically, VetGen, who I'm just about to start using, now have a test for not what was formerly non-testable chocolate, this cocoa gene, that I did a whole video on. So you can, you can remove dew claws when they're little, just being born, you can prick their pads, you can, um, make, you can cut their toenails short and make them bleed, or you can do a, a cheek swap. All of those are methods to get DNA test results. And it's gonna cost you some money. And that's not the same thing as the AKC DNA test. That is purely for parentage. Uh, I made the statement that fawns and sables don't have brindle. Yes. Uh, I don't know that I can stand by this 100%, but in my experience, any dog that is either fawn or sable never had a copy of brindle. Uh, somebody's asking about, can you tell us about the rise in progesterone levels at and after ovulation? Okay, so here is this old graph that I keep on drawing for you. I'm going to do it again. Progesterone here, measured in nanograms per milliliter. Zero being a dog that's not in heat at all or a low number. So this number goes all the way up to you know, maybe 60 at some point. So we'll just put some markers in here. There's a 30 and there's a 15. Okay. And here is day, this is the first signs of blood, is day one. And this thing then typically around day 11 through 13 is the point that typically you're breeding a dog. And what happens is this progesterone level rises from zero to five, doesn't do much for about the first five days. It's pretty low. And then all of a sudden, uh, at about day nine, it's at a five. So it starts to do a climb, and then it does a really rapid climb, and stays at some high number before it does a precipitous drop about the time that we're at whelping, which is from this point, from day one of blood, is something in the order of maybe 72 days. Not from ovulation, but that's from, from when this whole process starts. So the question is, how does this rise? That was the question. So here is my general rule of thumb. Day one through five, the number is less than one. Day six, day six, day six, it's at a one. It then goes up one point every day till it gets to a level of five. So day seven, day seven, Nasty job. Day seven is a two, day eight is a three, day nine is a four, day ten is a five. So that is ovulation. There it is. That's ovulation. And that is that point right there. And you know, day ten, day nine, day eight, day eleven, I mean it varies, but this just I mean typically I take something around day nine or ten being typically is ovulation. And that's the point that the blood colour on your girl typically will have gone from a pretty dark red to a much lighter, pinker, vanilla-y color. Then this goes up, it almost doubles every day. So day 11, this has gone up to an eight. Day 12, this has gone up to a 15. Day 13, this is at a 22. And I'm not gonna give you numbers after that because I don't know. But it doesn't really matter because you're done with all of your breathing once you've got past this point. Whether exactly where you are on this graph at this point is irrelevant because you're not breeding, you're too late. You're not breeding if you're up in here. You're not gonna get a litter or you're gonna get, I mean, you'll get a litter possibly, but it's gonna be small. So this point here, I'm calling this site day 11 through 13. And I'm calling this point here where you're outside the breeding period is definitely day 20. And this can vary, but the point here is, is if you see a level of five, that's ovulation, breed two days later. So this is the best day to AI. This is the AI date for a vaginal, and this is the AI date for a surgical. 
And why do you do a surgical a day later? Because the semen doesn't have to travel up the vaginal tract, it's dumped directly into the uterus, or the uterine walls. So, to answer the question, when you see a dog that's got to a level of five, you can figure that you're breeding in two days. If it's at a level of eight, you can assume you're breeding in the next day. If it's a level of 15, you need to get on with it right now. So I hope that answers the question for you. Okay. Dumping that one. A next question. What needs to be done when you received shipped semen. So someone has sent semen to you for you to impregnate your dog. So what needs to be done? So the first thing is, is when you receive it, take the whole box it comes into and put it in the fridge. Not the freezer, put it in the fridge. Because we don't want this getting warmed up. So stick it in the fridge, that's the first thing. The second thing is get your timing right. Decide when you're going to breed this dog. Get timing right. So hopefully you've got this at the right time and you're ready to do an insemination now. Number three, take your dog out to pee. So we're getting ready to do the insemination. Take female out to pee. We don't want her peeing right after you've done the insemination. Number four is to you know, if you're going to the vet, the vet's going to take care of this. If you're going to do this yourself, then look at my uh, instructions on how to AI. But this is the point where you're going to open up the container which has the semen in it. And what I recommend that you do is check for viability. So if you've got a microscope, check for viability. If you have a microscope, then you need to put a little drop on a slide and watch it. It'll take a little bit of time four or five minutes for it to warm up a little well, a few minutes for it to warm up so you see some activity. But what you want to know is, do you see lots of sperm wriggling around? If they're all not moving, you've got yourself a problem. If, just as a gross evaluation, if you look underneath that and you're seeing in a fairly low power lots and lots of dots, a big swarm of them just generally all jostling around, you're probably correct. The really the way to do it is to have a sperm count done. And if, unless you have a graduated slide, you've done this before, you're not getting this done yourself. That's a trip to the vet. So obviously, once you've opened this thing up and you're going to go to town, you can't just repatch it back up and go to the vet and check it. That's a complete waste of time. You've got to, once you've opened this thing up, you're either going to evaluate an AI or you're just simply going to AI. What do you need to do to it? Nothing. Do you need to let it warm up? No. You just Get yourself a rod, get you a syringe, suck up the semen into the AI rod, follow my other videos on how to show you how to do the AI. But the answer is, you should not need to do anything other than having your girl ready so that you don't mess around. You don't want to take this thing out and leave it on the counter for the next hour while you're getting ready to do the insemination. You want to take it out and do the insemination within 10 minutes. But it's not as though there's a clock that says after 10 minutes they're all dead. It's not that. But it's the fresher they are, when they start waking up, you want to use it. You don't want them to run out of steam. Uh, oh, somebody here has a boxer that they did tail docks. And after they did that, one of the puppies was crying all night long and was dead in the morning. So the question is, did, did, did the tail docking cause that problem? Well, probably not. I mean, I don't know anything about tail docking, so I'm certainly not an expert in this by any stretch of the imagination. But here's my thoughts on this. If you dock a tail and it starts bleeding profusely, you've got a problem and you've got to stop the bleeding. If it's just a little bit of blood and it soaks up onto a napkin and then 10 minutes later it's just dotting on a napkin, it's not a problem. But if it's bleeding profusely and continue to bleed, you need to do something, which means that you could, for instance, go put a stitch in it, you may be able to get some super glue, put some super glue on the end and pinch the, pinch the tail where the, where the wound is shut. Uh, if you can't get that sorted out, it's time to go to the vet and probably have a stitch put in it. Um, but I very much doubt that that was the cause of the problem. I mean, you know, it'd be like saying, look, if I whacked your finger off, would I expect you to die overnight? And the answer to this is, if I whacked your finger off, you'd be really pissed off at me, but you would not die overnight. It's, you'd probably be fine. Okay. Um, someone's asking, how do I get my ship make, shipping products returned to me after I've sent them out to do an AI? The answer to that is, I put a return label on every box that goes out cost me about 11 to $12 to do that. So they just put everything back in the box and send it back to me. And 
I do have some control because I don't sign off on the litter registration until I've got my kit back. That's pretty important. Um, someone's asking about our incubators. They're worried about their puppies suffocating if they leave them in there for a long time. So the answer to this is, as of about six months ago, all of our incubators have a vented top to the lid. They have a vent hole. The, the large incubators have two, the small ones have one. So there's always circulation there and you don't need to leave the, the lid open, it will be fine. Uh, is it possible for two normal sized dogs to produce a very small puppy? Absolutely it is. So, so the question here is, what is going on with a small puppy? Is that a problem? Is it just a very small puppy? So, if you look at <clears throat> distribution of, this is puppy size, versus their, the number, the number of puppies, the number of puppies you'd expect. You will see what's called a Poisson graph of what you expect to see, a normal distribution, of which 50% of all puppies will be of average size. Obviously average size depends on the litter. Great Danes are going to have bigger dogs than Chihuahuas, but 50% of the puppies are going to be of average size. But you're also going to get out here on the extremes some very large puppies and some very small puppies. So, is it possible? Absolutely. Is it possible a normal distribution graph? And so in a normal distribution of healthy puppies, the majority of them are right around us a band, which is probably represented by the average weight of the two parents. But you can get some very small ones and you can get some very big ones. And the more puppies you have in a litter, the more chance there are of seeing those extremes. But there are some other factors going on here as well, besides just this normal distribution. So normal distribution works in everything to do with statistics. It's there on everything. But there are some reasons that you can have small puppies that can be problems. So one of them, of course, is that the puppy has some kind of internal defect, maybe things like a liver shunt. That's where the liver is not being processing um, blood properly and it shunts around the liver and the dog then has, can, can die over it or could be very small or mal, malnutri malnutrition and be a small dog. So there's things like internal problems that can cause dogs to have problems. So there's internal issues that we don't know about that we have to enlist a vet and some time and effort for things like liver shunts. So those are, they're not common, but they're certainly not, they do happen. So that's one cause of it. Another one can be, uh, you have what's called a, what we call water on the brain. It's a, um, it's a um, uh, not brasos um well anyway, we just, I can't remember the Latin name now, sorry, the water on the brain. So this is, this is a dog that typically has a rather, it tends to be small, this is what I'm talking about, this is a small dog, it tends to have a head that has a dome shape to it, it its skull, it doesn't look right, it looks more kind of dome shaped than it should do. And tend to, its eyes tend to be on the side and its eyes tend to be bugged out. And that is, uh, I'm going to put an unsappy because it's not a happy dog. So that is, that is a dog that basically what's happened is, is that um, fluid from the brain goes down through some openings in the skull. And I, I may have this totally wrong, but basically there has to be a drain path for brain fluid to get down through the spine. And if that gets clogged, you get an overpressure in the brain, you end up with this larger skull, eyes that tend to be pushed out to the side of bug eye, and that is a dog that has, I'm gonna call this water on the brain. Um, that's the non-technical name for it. Um, I can't even think of the right name for it now. It's not brasophysalic, but it's uh, hydrophysalic, hydro being water, hydrophysalic. Uh, so those dogs, they can, they, they, there's one of three outcomes here. One is that this gets unclogged and they end up being normal dogs. Another one is that they end up being small dogs and they have this, but they can still maybe lead a normal life. And the third one is they die from it. So that can be a cause of small dogs. Um, and then there are other reasons that you can have small dogs that don't necessarily say stay small, but another one would be, I wiped a lot off, didn't need to, but the other one would be things like maternal parasites, which is clearly quite common. Giardia, the coccidia, two very, very common parasites in puppies. 
roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, all of these things you can absolutely sort out by having a proper regime of worming your dogs every two weeks, starting at two weeks old. Which brings me to another question here about safeguard. So, one of the things that you should be doing, you should be worming your puppies, regardless of whether you think there's worms there or not. And you should do this at two, four, six, eight, ten, and if they've left, you're done, but 12 weeks. So, these first two, we use Nemex. Two. It's a very safe puff. It's a puff of After that, we use Safeguard. Safeguard. Safeguard is also, you think by its name, is safe, and I believe that it is. But you don't use it on puppies under six weeks old, and it does kill more stuff. So it's really pretty good about killing more stuff than Emix 2 is. Uh, so it'll kill Giardia, and most of the common worms will be got rid of with Safeguard. But there are other products that you can use. By the way, one of the things that we now have in our, uh, our um, website is you can buy snap tests for Giardia. You just take a little bit of their poo on a stick, put it on this buffer solution, drop a drop of it into a little cassette. Five minutes later, it tells you whether your dogs have got Giardia. This is a super common thing to get. I test all of my puppies for Giardia routinely. And um, if there's any sign of it at all, I've hopefully got rid of it with a safeguard anyway. There are other products like um, uh, metrondazole, metrondazole, which is a typical antibiotic to treat Giardia. And then the other big one is coccidia, which safeguard does not fix, coccidia. And the normal treatment for that is to put them on Albon for like five days. There are other products out there like, which I like, like taruxazil, it's a horse coccidia medication, works really well. Okay. Um, oh, is my blue a lilac? She's five days old. Okay. So, a lilac dog is both a blue dog and a chocolate dog all rolled into one. So, a lilac dog is a little d, little d, and a little b, little d. That is a lilac dog. So until about the beginning of this month, you couldn't test most, most dogs for chocolate, but you can now, and it's called the Coco Gene. And you can go to Vet Gen, and you absolutely can test that now. So you can prove whether your dog actually has the right ingredients to be a lilac. This dog will also have a red eye glow. So that's the other thing that you can do. Now, this red eye glow will not be visible until first their eyes are open in 10 days. Obviously, you can't do that test before then. But typically, it doesn't show up very well. In fact, you'll see some videos of a couple of litters that I have where I'm trying to determine whether or not these puppies are lilacs, whether, they, whether they're chocolates, whether they have the red eye glow, and they're like four weeks old, and it's not very convincing at all. So what you see in a dog when it's very young, here's the eye iris and there's this outer ring, and this center area here tends to have a kind of a burgundy, dark burgundy look to it when it first starts to show signs of eye glow. And that might be at three weeks, but it probably will not show up before then. And it gets a lot more prominent by the time they're you know, eight weeks old. You have a much, much better chance of telling. So how do you, how do you tell for sure? Well, the answer is do the vet gen test and you know. So you, you, don't, you can't tell on this girl at all. The only way that you know for sure, by the way, that uh, you have a lilac dog would be because you know the genetics of the parents and they're both little b, little b. And if they are, that dog has to be chocolate. And if, it's, and if it looks blue, it's a lilac. Uh, someone's asking about where to get bottles and feeding tubes. Well, we sell them. We sell them as part of our puppy care kit. For a $99 puppy care kit, you get all kinds of stuff in there, including bottles and feeding tubes, and goat's milk, and scales, and trimmers for their toes, and scissors to cut navel cords off with, and uh, ear scopes, and stethoscopes, all part of that $99 package. But you can buy them online. Uh, someone's asking about the position that I have on my hands when I am trying to get a sample of semen from a dog. Okay, so I'm going to do my graphical drawings here. So this is the dog. So basically when the dog is erect, you've got testicles back here. There is a knot that forms. The gland forms right here, a swelling that forms. 
And this is the rest of the dog here. What you do is you put your fingers right between those two places there and just put firm pressure on that area right there. What the purpose of this swelling is here is when it is doing a natural tie with the dog, this swells up inside the female's vagina and ties the male to the female. It's called the tie. And so sometimes this whole skin will come back and expose that gland. That's not a problem at all. Doesn't matter whether it's exposed, whether you expose it or not, it's completely irrelevant because what you're collecting is coming out the end here into a cup. What happens here doesn't matter as far as the skin is concerned. What does matter as far as the skin is concerned though is if you've done this, you want to make sure that when the dog has finished and five minutes later everything's retracted back inside and he's not hanging out and got a nasty swollen end to his penis where it's been constricted by the skin. If that's the case, get some Vaseline on it and push it back in. You don't want to leave a dog in that situation. So anytime that you have collected from a dog, you want to go back five minutes later and make sure he's all retracted and everything's okay because you don't want to damage the head of his penis by the fact that it's been rubbing on the ground or something else. So anyway, so the answer is the pressure is applied right here. That will make him start humping away and hopefully we will start to ejaculate within a few seconds to a minute or two with you doing that. So then they're talk, ask another question about evaluation. They're talking about testing their dog in preparation for this one week, uh, one week apart to, to check for semen uh, uh, the, the dog can basically produce. That's a great idea. You don't want to pull from a dog a few days before you need that dog without using it because his semen count will drop when you do the next pull. It takes about a week for what has been produced from the dog to be replenished. So you don't want to just start pulling from a dog every day and then expect two days later to get a good, good collection, because you will not. But it, it, they, they talk about doing a collection at home and then taking that to the vet to be evaluated because it's much more comfortable at home. That is not going to work because by the time you've got to the vet, the semen sample will probably be dead. So they'll be able to tell you about the quantity of semen, but they will not be able to tell you about the very important thing, which is motility how much of that semen is alive. You're going to have to do that at the vet, otherwise I think you're going to have not much luck on that. Okay, how do you make champagnes? Well, a champagne is a chocolate dog that is also a cream dog. That's a champagne. <clears throat> it has a red eye glow, go to the vet gen and test for it. It will look, physically look cream, but it will be a different shade of cream typically than what you see in a straight cream dog. More of a kind of a chocolatey look to it. But that is, a, that is a lilac. If it's also a blue dog, then it becomes, that is a lilac. So that is a lilac. All of that together becomes a lilac. And those two together become a champagne. That's a champagne. Right, excuse me, that is, sorry, I got this wrong. That's a platinum. That is a platinum. This here, these two together here, that is a lilac. That is a lilac. A blue and chocolate dog together is a lilac. A blue chocolate cream dog is a platinum. A chocolate cream dog is a champagne. And we don't have a name for a blue and a cream dog. We don't have a name for that. But what I call that is a blue covered in cream. That's what I call Anytime you have a little e, little e dog, it will always look cream, regardless of anything else that might be going on. Brindle, 10 points, pied, blues, chocolates, all little e dogs look cream, various different colors. Cream can be anything from a really almost white color through to an apricot color. They are all creams. So it can be a bit confusing sometimes to decide whether you have a cream dog or a fawn dog. And the only way to tell that one is to do a test or know about its parentage. And I think that's enough for now. We'll break this up into another Q&A session. Hey, thanks again for watching, folks. Um, really appreciate your feedback. Um, if you like us, please subscribe to us. Um, if you have things that you want like us to answer for you, then put them in the comments section, and we'll try and take care of those on the next one that we do. And uh, hey, have fun with your dogs. Be nice to them. Bye, everybody.